Julian Faulkner, Legal Counsel for Anishinaabe Asking Nation. Good morning, Akosa Matthews, Legal Counsel for Anishinaabe Asking Nation. Good morning, Melissa Chan and Jonathan Tarleton for Attorney General of Canada. Good morning, everyone. I believe that the schedule uh, that we have for today is that we have Nan that will start this morning. Is that correct? Uh, I think your microphone is closed. That is correct, Chair. Okay. Are you ready to start? I am ready. Please go ahead. Thank you. Chair, uh, panel member, uh, uh, my name, as you know, is Julian Faulkner, and I represent Anishinaabe Aski Nation along with my colleague, Ms. Sakosua Matthews and other counsel who uh, uh, include uh, Mr. Anthony Morgan and Mr. Mark Gibson as a team. Uh, we have had the honor of representing Anishinaabe Aski Nation in this matter uh, for uh, close to a year, but this represents the first substantive time we appear before you. Uh, immediate relief is really in the eyes of the beholder, isn't it? Um, I wanted to start the process uh, by uh, acknowledging and recognizing my clients in the room, if I may. Behind me are the lead, many of the leadership from Anishinaabe Aski Nation. So Deputy Grand Chief Annabetti Achni Paneskam, Chiefs McKay, uh, Chief uh, Kevin Tanji, Deputy Chief Earl Chichu, Chief Crane. These uh, Chiefs and Chief Mc Chief McKay from Bearskin Lake. These chiefs have come a very long way. Nishnabi Aski Nation uh, obtained standing in these proceedings uh, on the basis of representing uh, remote First Nations communities in Northern Ontario. As you know, uh, Chair, panel member, as you know, uh, Nishnabi Aski Nation consists of 49 First Nation communities. Uh, 34 of those 49 are fly in communities. The territory that Anishinaabe Aski Nation, a political territorial organization, in other words, a government for the north, the territory it represents uh, represents approximately two thirds of the province of Ontario, larger than the country of France, to give people an idea of the geographical span. Yet the population is somewhere in the midst of uh, 50,000. We also uh, are honored to have with us a Deputy Grand Chief uh, Derek Fox who's also present. I wanted to uh, emphasize this at the beginning because in presenting the perspective of uh, remote First Nation communities, it is useful to understand the distances traveled. Bearskin Lake uh, First Nation, uh, Chief McKay's uh, community, is some 1,450 kilometers north of here. Slate Falls, Chief Crane's community is some 1,335 kilometers north of here. Chief Tanji's community, Brunswick House, is some 1,000 kilometers north of here. Moose Cree, Deputy Chief Chichu's community, some 720 kilometers. And Chief Crane's, uh, sorry, Deputy Grand Chief uh, Achni Paneskam's community, Martin Falls, is 1,000 kilometers from here. And so Deputy Grand Chief Fox knows I remember things. Bearskin Lake is also his community that I had the honor of landing with him in uh, not too long ago. I say these things because when we speak of communities that are such a distance, uh, both in uh, in time, in access, and in our minds, we talk about those communities as remote communities. It was Deputy Chief Chichu from uh, Moose Cree who talked to me one day about the notion remote. He asked me the following question. He asked me, why are we remote in relation to them? Why aren't they remote in relation to us? And you know, it's not often that people say Julian Faulkner had nothing to say, but he had nothing to say. I, it was an actual showstopper for me because I didn't have an answer. It's as if we consider we're the center of all things and they are remote. And what Deputy Chief Chichu reminded me of is maybe, maybe it's not about who's remote. It's just about distance, distance in travel, distance in mind, 
uh, and distance uh, between us culturally. I will use the word remote because it has become part of the lexicon, but I ask us to consider that we are all part of this country uh, and that uh, no one is more remote than the other and all of our communities are centers, are centers of activity and centers of prosperity and centers of culture. When NAN was granted uh, standing, when Nishnabi Aski Nation was granted standing uh, in March of 2016 uh, by this panel, you pointed out that it was very rare to provide a party standing some seven to eight years into a process. And uh, on behalf of NAN, on behalf of Grand Chief Fiddler and the executive of Nishnabi Aski Nation, we extend gratitude uh, for the uh, uh, honor of allowing uh, NAN to speak for its communities and we understand that it is exceptional. It is exceptional in that we are in essence duty bound to respect the work done by those who came before NAN in these proceedings. Those who continue the work, the Caring Society, uh, Assembly First Nation as main complainants in these proceedings, uh, Chiefs of Ontario, Amnesty International, the, the Commission, all of these parties have played very significant roles in advancing the proceedings. They've made the Respondent Canada answerable if they make the very good point, and Nan supports that point, that Canada has yet to answer properly. But the bottom line is we rely on their work. We climb on the shoulders of Cindy Blackstock. We climb on the shoulders of AFN. We climb on the shoulders of Ku to make submissions to you. And we wish to acknowledge their very important work. My submissions will be uh, divided uh, into four parts. I will be addressing uh, firstly, uh, what we refer to as the remoteness quotient. Secondly, we will be addressing the issue of choose life orders, as we referred them to them in our materials. Third, we will address the question of relief for uh, agencies in NAN communities. And finally, we will have some concluding remarks about jurisdiction. So uh, taking into account that uh, we are all operating under strict uh, timelines, I'm going to uh, cut to the chase in terms of my materials. NAN is seeking orders under uh, what we title the notion of a remoteness quotient. This is set out in our immediate relief factum at paragraph 9. I'm not going to ask you to turn it up. I have, uh, with uh, the assistance of uh, Ms. Matthews and others in, on our team, placed a very big binder in front of you. We call this binder a compendium. It's supposed to be an easy way to access materials. It's amazing how lawyers can make really easy things very big and cumbersome. So I'm going to refer to it from time to time, but to be honest, it's my view that we are better served uh, giving you sites. But from time to time, this will be the binder I direct your attention to. It, will, it represents, as I said, a compendium, and so it hasn't added materials to these proceedings. It's simply uh, taken bits and pieces of excerpts and put them together in a fashion uh, that will permit easy access. What uh, you'll see in terms of the issue of the remoteness quotient is first and foremost in an amended motion uh, before you that was filed uh, uh, originally at the end of January 2017. Nishnabi Aski Nation took the position that it was time to officially, empirically, and as a pure matter of economics, 
recognize the challenges, increased costs of services, the barriers faced by communities in the north. There are umpteen number of social justice issues that plague uh, First Nations, Inuit and Métis across this country. It is uh, trite to say that for First Nations in NAN communities, those issues are amplified and aggravated by virtue of the distances they live from what we consider to be the center. We say that while there are umpteen number of social justice issues, a long history of colonialism, an extraordinary history of racism and oppression that indigenous people have suffered in this country. In the case of the topic of the remoteness quotient, it is actually an economic question. It is actually a numbers issue. Why do I say that? I say that because at the end of the day, when decisions are being made about providing supports to indigenous people, one size does not fit all. For the communities that live in Bearskin Lake or Slate Falls, they face a cost of goods and services, barriers to recruitment, and realities that are actually capable of adjustment by index. Do I put it too simply? Of course. But at the same time, it is a numbers exercise. There is a way to adjust for supports provided to remote communities by what we say is the application of a remoteness quotient. Will it solve all? Absolutely not. But here's what it will address, first and foremost. An ongoing double discrimination that is suffered by these communities. It is extraordinary that in 2017, I could ask a witness the following question, and this was asked of the Health Canada witness, Ms. Buckland. I asked the following question. Does the federal government account for remoteness in respect of funding provided in Ontario? And you will know through the compliance report provided in October of 2016, that the federal government candidly acknowledged that for the purposes of Ontario, there is no adjustment to funding for the realities of remoteness. Meaning, a community in southern Ontario, when they make a decision about what should be provided to that community by way of supports and funding, will receive precisely the same amount as a community deeply in the north, with no adjustment for the realities, a one-size-fits-all approach. I asked Ms. Buckland an examination. When employees work for Canada, for the federal government, nurses, is that how it works? If you're a nurse and you're working in southern Ontario, are you paid precisely the same as a nurse that works, say, in a, in a treatment center or a nurse that works in a clinic, in a health clinic in Slate Falls? And the answer was, Oh, no, no. In Slate Falls, for nurses working for the federal government, we adjust their salary with a remoteness index. We have, as she pointed out in evidence, what's called an isolated post allowance. And we give an actual quantifiable index for each remote community. The federal government long ago learned how to compensate their employees for remoteness. Sadly, tragically, that same lesson has never been learned for Indigenous children. This goes a long way to speaking to an important issue. Out of sight, out of mind. Those nurses are in sight. Why are they in sight? Well, they come from the South. They insist on actual equity with their nursing colleagues that are working in urban centers. They insist on that equity. The communities that are represented by the deputies and the chiefs that are here today, they're out of sight and they're out of mind. And so the indigenous children 
that are their sacred responsibility are out of sight and are out of mind. We believe that there is an empirical way to take a first run at trying to fix this, and we call this a remoteness quotient. We don't say it in some platitude. We have filed affidavit material. You know this, Chair and panel member, you know that we have provided serious record materials in the form of an affidavit by experts. Dr. Thomas Wilson of the University of Toronto, Mr. David Barnes. These experts form the basis for the following opinion, that the creation of an index, the creation of a remoteness quotient is completely doable. And some of these submissions, I acknowledge, are redundant in the sense they were made before you by way of immediate relief written submissions. We have not had an opportunity to appear on the record in a public forum before today. So I did start from the beginning a little bit, but it was intended to give context. We as lawyers struggle with our communication skills. Uh, you know, I don't want to include my colleagues here. They're much better at it than I am, especially Mr. Nowagabel. But having said that, we all struggle from law school on. We were never taught to actually communicate to people. So I consider it our first obligation when I appear on the public record to be communicative and clear about what we're talking about today, rather than launching into written submissions, giving you paragraph numbers that nobody but us in the room could understand. So that's why I've taken the time, and I, I, I hope you'll indulge me on that. I want to, if I may now, uh, direct your attention to uh, the compendium that deals with the views of the experts. And as you know, uh, Chair, panel member, uh, this uh, topic, the remoteness quotient, has what I would call a, a piece of good news attached to it. And I foreshadow that at this point, which is the following. As a result of our submissions, as a result of the materials filed, which some of which I'm going to take you through right now, Nishnabi Aski Nation has actually arrived at a resolution with Canada on the development of a remoteness quotient, the phase one and phase two developments. It is uh, uh, a resolution that uh, NAN is urging and Canada is consenting to, uh, and it is a resolution I expect you'll hear from other parties on. But I want to be clear, we have moved for this relief and Canada is consenting. We consider that very important news. On behalf of the panel, we're just Every resolution is a good news, so uh, congratulations. We'll, we look forward to hear what you have to say about that. Thank you. And I, I want to emphasize that um, from the point of view of Nishnabi Aski Nation, the existence of this resolution is an important step. But having said that, the compliance issues raised by the Caring Society, by Assembly First Nations, by Chiefs of Ontario, these are legitimate issues that NAN supports. And so while resolutions are good news, the outstanding compliance issues that they highlight NAN supports and believes need to be addressed as a matter of immediate relief. I simply wanted to point that out. 